In this video, I'm going to introduce the accounting system that was developed many centuries ago in the Roman Empire and has subsequently been adopted by the whole world. I'm going to teach you about debits and credits and how to put transactions into the two accounting books. There are two books in accounting, the journal and the ledger. The journal is all of the transactions listed by date, and the ledger is uh, the same transactions sorted by account. So sorted by date and sorted by account. In the old days, accountants had to input the transactions into both books. But nowadays, with computers, uh, we don't even have to think of debits and credits. The, the data entry screens remove us from these uh, debits and credits. Uh, although they still exist in the logic of the software, um, we just have to input to the computer one time and the computer will sort the data either by date or by account as needed. Let's talk about the words debit and credit. Most people have heard these words, but these words have different meaning in the accounting office than they do out in the general population. Outside of the accounting office, debit means subtract, but that's not necessarily true in the accounting office. And outside of the accounting office, credit usually means to add, but that's not true, not always true, inside the accounting office. This is sometimes a stumbling block for students that have already learned these words with different meanings. Now you're going to have to consciously pause whenever you hear the words debit and credit until you can, your mind can uh, be fluent with the new meanings of these words. In accounting, it's best to think of debit as the left side of an account, and credit means the right side of an account. So you've got two columns. You've got the debit column on the left and the, a credit column on the right. Half the time in accounting, debit means to add, and half the time, debit means to subtract. Half the time, credit means to add, and half the time, credit means to subtract. You'll get used to this in a while. Every transaction that we input into the books must have at least one debit and at least one credit. It is possible to have multiple debits or multiple credits, but usually most transactions have just one debit and one credit. And debits and credits must always be equal every time we input a transaction. In modern times, when using a computer screen, they don't usually say debit and credit, and they don't ask us for two numbers. They just ask us for one number to keep it simple for the person doing the data entry. But the computer software will recognize the one number that is input and put it into two places, a debit place and a credit place. This is called double entry accounting. Double entry accounting is referring to one or more debit effects and one or more credit effects. So if there are three numbers in a transaction, that's still double entry accounting because we're referring to the concept of debits and credits. Now let's look again at this slide that you've seen in a previous video. Here's the accounting equation and underneath the categories, I have listed debits on the left, credits on the right and you see the plus and the minus signs. Notice the, the pattern of those plus and minus signs. Uh, you won't have to intentionally try to memorize that, those, but eventually, if you're a good student doing all your homework, you will be referring to those pluses and minuses so frequently that eventually you will have it memorized and you will no longer need to look at uh, this page for a reference. So. Let's look at the asset category. <clears throat> the plus sign is on the debit side. 
And that means if we want to increase an asset, we have to put the number on the left side, on the left column. So to increase cash, we debit cash. That sounds exactly wrong to beginners. Uh, beginners think debit means to subtract. Look at the next account, accounts receivable. When somebody owes us money, we put the number on the left side because they owe us more money. When they pay us, we'll cancel that balance by putting a number on the right side, on the credit side. Now, what follows in this video is, I am going to introduce to you 10 journal entries. These are the most common journal entries in the textbook. Uh, these are the most common entries of the year. If you learn these 10 and, and if you learn them fast, well, I would say that 80% of all the journal entries and ledger entries that, that you would make in a year would be similar to one of these 10. So let's learn these 10 very well. This is the ledger. Every account that we're going to use can be depicted as a T. These are called T accounts. The left side is the debit column and the right side is the credit column. A real ledger has more columns. It has a column for the date. It has a column for comments. Uh, it has a column for posting reference and another column for running balance. But these two columns are the most important columns of a standard eight column ledger page. And uh, I don't have room on this slide to show eight columns for every one of the accounts. So I'm just showing the two most important columns, the debit column and the credit column. Now, over the next 10 slides, I'm going to show you 10 transactions and I'm going to input them into T accounts. I'm going to debit one T account and credit another T account. At the end of these trans 10 transactions, these ledger entries, then I will show you one clean page of a journal. The same 10 transactions input into a journal. I have to first teach the ledger because all the logic is, is uh, visually evident in a ledger, but not in a journal because the journal is... Uh, the shorthand of the ledger. To do a journal entry, you have to have a ledger in your mind. Well, beginning students don't yet have that ledger in your mind. So first, let's thoroughly understand the ledger, and then the journal will be easy afterwards. Here is our first transaction. The first three transactions are going to be very similar. We're going to buy an asset, and we're going to pay with cash. So look at this one. We're buying supplies. So we have to debit supplies. See the plus sign under the debit column? We want to increase supplies by putting the number on the debit side, the side with the plus sign. And we're going to pay cash, and we will credit cash. That sounds wrong to a beginner's ears, but that is correct. Every time we pay cash, we credit cash. And when we receive cash, every time we debit cash. This is double entry accounting. We have a debit and we have a credit. The fluent way to say this would be debit supplies, credit cash. In fluent accounting, we would say the, the account that we're going to debit first and then say the account that we're going to credit second because that's the order of the journal, and so that's the order that we often speak. Here's our next transaction, very similar to the first. We're buying another asset, a different asset. We're buying insurance. We're gonna debit prepaid insurance because we're buying multiple months, let's say six months. Uh, since we're buying multiple months, this will benefit our future. And the second definition of an asset is something that will benefit the future. And we will credit cash because we're paying cash. To credit cash is to subtract cash from our account. Every time we pay, we credit. Every time we receive cash, we debit. One more thing on this. If we were paying only one month of insurance, 
we would just debit insurance expense. But if we pay for multiple months, we will debit the asset. And then later on in a future chapter, I will show you how to move the prepaid insurance over to rent ex or over to insurance expense at the end of the year. All right, I told you the third time. The third transaction is similar to the first two. We're buying an asset and we're paying cash. We debit prepaid rent if we're paying for multiple months of rent and we credit cash because we always credit cash when we pay cash. Why are we debiting prepaid rent? Because we are paying multiple months of rent in advance. If we were only paying one month of rent, we would debit the rent expense account. But since we're paying multiple months, that will benefit our future and we have to put it as an asset. And then in the next chapter, I will show you how to transfer the prepaid rent over to rent expense at the end of the year. In this transaction, we are purchasing inventory, but this time we are not paying cash. We are purchasing the inventory on account. When, whenever I say we're buying something on account, we're going to owe and look at the accounts payable. Look at the plus sign. It's on the credit side. Whenever we owe more money, we put the number on the credit side. The fluent way to say this is debit inventory and credit accounts payable. Okay, in the previous slide, we purchased inventory on account. Now, some days later, we're actually going to pay that balance. We're going to pay on account. Every time we pay cash, we're going to credit cash. So we know that's a credit. If you know one of these for sure, if you know the debit or the credit, if you know one of them for sure, then the other has to be the opposite. Well, I know that every time I pay cash, I credit cash. Therefore, I must debit accounts payable. Well, that makes sense because I'm paying off a balance. I'm subtracting or canceling with the debit to accounts payable. How would I say this fluently? Debit accounts payable, credit cash. In this case, I'm a consultant. I spend time with you. I work, I, I give you my advice. And then I finish, I earn cash and you pay me on the spot. Debit cash because we received cash, we increase the cash with a debit. Whenever cash is involved in a transaction, I usually start with cash and figure out if it's a debit or a credit to cash. It's really easy to pin that down. When you receive cash, it's a debit. Therefore, the other account must be credited. Had I started with the revenue account, I, had to, I would have to think a little deeper as a beginner. So if, you're, if you find yourself confused, uh, stop thinking about the T account you're, you're, you're thinking about. Go to the other T account. Or always start with cash if it's one of the two accounts involved. It's usually easier to nail down the cash and then the other account is going to be the opposite. So if you know it's a debit to cash, then you can feel certain that it would be a credit to the revenue. All right, I'm still the consultant. I talked to a different client, but the second client doesn't pay me cash on the spot. I say that I have earned on account. I earn after I finish a job. On account means cash was not exchanged. I will debit accounts receivable because I have a customer or a client now that owes me more money. When somebody owes me money, that's something that will benefit my future. And that's an asset. If a customer owes me more money, I will record that as a debit to accounts receivable. Now, a few days later, let's say that that customer or client sends me a check in the mail or transfers money to my account. Then I debit cash and I credit accounts receivable. I credit accounts receivable to subtract the balance or to cancel the balance that that customer has on my books. How do I say this fluently? Debit cash, uh, credit accounts receivable. 
In this transaction, we are issuing stock. To issue means to give. What am I giving? I'm giving a percentage ownership in the business and I'm receiving cash. So I debit cash and credit common stock. The common stock account is used when investors give cash to the business. And remember the dividends account is used when the business pays cash back out to the owners. How do we say this fluently? Debit dividends, credit cash. Remember, we're crediting cash every time we disperse cash. This one is a little bit tricky. We should go a little slower analyzing this one. Whenever we receive cash before we earn it, we technically owe that money back. So we will debit cash because we possess it and we will credit a liability because on our books, we need to show that we owe it back. Later in the next chapter, I will show you how to transfer this money out of the liability account and over to the revenue account, but only after we earn the money. Pay the wages. Start with the cash account. What do we do? Do we debit or credit cash? Well, every time we pay cash, we subtract and we subtract with a credit. So if we know that we credit cash, then we can feel comfortable knowing that we must debit the wages expense account. Sometimes students start analyzing this with the wages expense account and their mind goes blank. If your mind goes blank, just move over to cash. It's easier to collect yourself and nail down if you're supposed to debit or credit cash. And then the other account would be the opposite. We're going to make a loan or give a loan to somebody. We're going to give cash. We credit cash when we pay cash. Now notice on this account notes receivable, I made the title red because in the previous slides that was saying accounts receivable, but I didn't have room to add another T account. So I changed that to notes receivable. A note is just uh, a more formal agreement than an account receivable. And in our textbook, a note receivable will bear interest. So we will debit notes receivable and credit cash every time we give a loan. If we borrow money, we receive cash. So we have more cash, we debit cash, and we credit notes payable. This is our last transaction, number 10. I saved the hardest one for last. Notice there are four numbers in this transaction. It's really two transactions that are written as one. This is the most common transaction in the world. It's whenever we sell inventory. Let's look at the two $1,000 numbers. This represents cash going through the cash register at a store. If the store receives cash from a customer or if the customer uses a credit card, the accountant still considers that cash. So when we receive cash at the cash register, we debit cash and we credit sales. Easy enough. Part two of this journal entry shows inventory exiting the store. So look at the inventory account in the asset category. We want to subtract inventory from there with a credit and we will then debit cost of goods sold. The cost of goods sold represents inventory that has left the store. Okay, look at this. This is the journal. This is the other book. Look how nice and clean it it is and how concise. I couldn't teach you the logic that I've been teaching uh, starting with the journal because all the logic is in the T accounts of the ledger. So first I showed you the ledger entries and every one of those 10 are right here in journal form. In the journal, you always write the debit account first and the credit account second. And you also well, it's standard in the textbook world to indent the second item, the 
the credit accounts. That's not always done, but it is almost always done in the textbook world. So there you have it. The journal has all of the transactions sorted by date, and the ledger has all the same transactions sorted by account. Every number that exists in the journal has to have a corresponding number in the ledger. 